following recording is done by Redemption Hill Church. We are delighted that you are listening in and pray that God would use this message to bless you and equip you to glorify His name. However, we also want to encourage you that this resource is in no way meant to replace your need for a local church or the biblical care and guidance you receive from your pastor and church elders. May God bless you as you listen to this sermon. If you join us this morning and you didn't uh, get to join us last week, um, welcome. And if you're watching this online and you haven't watched the previous week, I uh, really want to encourage you to do that because uh, a lot of the information there is going to be foundational for um, today, right? Like, so you're going to need that foundational understanding in order to. Um, make sense of, of what we're going to look at today and, and, and talk through today. And today I'm, I'm going to go a little bit different than last week. So what, what I intend to do today is share a little bit with you of my own experience. Um, and, you know, in the Christian community, we call that testifying. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, what my experience with, uh, with this has been and how it sort of got me here. Uh, and then I want to uh, go over to scripture and I want to look at some scripture uh, to to see if my experience uh, can can be matched up with what God has said about this um, and because you shouldn't do things because I had an experience you should listen because God said right so um you know my experience should reinforce what god has said and and i can say i've lived through this i've experienced this i can testify to this um but at the same time uh, god needs to say it for it to be a authentic real truth uh in your life so uh you know i shared a little bit last week about um you know, having some some mental struggles. I, I want to go into a little bit more depth on some of the things that I've struggled with in order to talk about how God has helped me fight through those things and overcome them. And I still struggle with them, but I absolutely believe that I've overcome them. And I, I don't think anybody that has spent time with me would say uh, that, that I haven't. Um, so, For about 20 years, maybe a, maybe a little less than 20 years, no one apart from my wife knew that I was struggling with, um, with issues, right? Uh, once I left the military in 2000, Yep. So I left the military in, in December of uh, 1999. Uh, so it was more like 15 years. Uh, so about 15 years, never told anybody, never, never got any help. Um, and, and Tracy was the only one that was aware, uh, that I was struggling with these things. And, and a lot of this time was also in the church, right? I mean, as a believer, uh, pursuing Christ, um, you know, just, just didn't tell people what was going on inside me, uh, the, the depth or, um, you know, the breadth of, of what happened inside my head. And because I wasn't seeking any help and because I wasn't seeking any, and I mean, outside help, uh, I was certainly seeking God in that. Uh, and, and Tracy and I, uh, Tracy's my wife, if y'all didn't know that, uh, had worked out a number of ways to deal with my issues. And so whenever I enter into a, a deep depression, right? Like, like that debilitating, can't, can't do, won't do, um, just, just the deepest darkness that I descend into, uh, I'm not in a position to make decisions. I'm not in a position to do uh, much of anything of real import as far as uh, leading my family, um, in, engaging in society, and, uh, and, and, you know, the normal things that a man should do. So early on, I realized 
that if I didn't want to get put back in an insane asylum, uh, and again, if you didn't hear last week, I'm not joking about that. Like they, they put me in one of those and I don't ever want to go back to that. And I realized that if I, if I didn't want to go back to that, that, uh, I needed someone that I could trust completely and that I could abdicate responsibility to when I could no longer, uh, be relied on. And for me, that person was, was my wife. And if you get into these situations, right, if you, if you have these, um, these, these sort of episodes, if you're struggling with, with these sort of, you know, mental and emotional, just shut down completely kind of problems where you can't, um, you can't work, uh, you can't play, you can't be, uh, in society, then, I'd encourage you to, to find someone like that. Uh, if, if you're married, it should be your spouse. Um, if, if you're not married, it should be a close friend or a, a parent or perhaps even an elder or teacher in the church, maybe someone that's discipling you. Um, but, but you need somebody to uh, counsel you and guide you when you cannot do it yourself. Um, at, at, at some level, despite the fact that I'm a full grown man and, uh, you know, over the age of 30, I'm well over the age of 30 now, but you know, I'm thinking, thinking back when, uh, you know, this was first starting, uh, you know, very much like a child, um, in that I, I needed someone else to tell me, uh, what, what was okay and what wasn't okay. Uh, and for me, that was especially important because of my tendencies towards violence, uh, you know, and my, my tendencies towards aggression, uh, you know, my, uh, my aggravation, uh, my, my, my pursuit of conflict, um, you know, I, I needed in those situations, right? Like, like that was my default. If, if I interacted with someone, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted to go straight into conflict and straight into, uh, a fight. And I was, I was constantly looking for that. Uh, you know, at, at this point in my, life, it was verbal. Um, it, it, we weren't, I mean, like there was within me a desire for physical violence, uh, but I was not, um, wasn't exercising that. Uh, but I would be verbally violent, uh, verbally aggressive, verbally abusive. Um, and I wouldn't be compassionate. And, and what I mean in that is I, I didn't pay attention to the other people around me and I didn't comprehend what they were thinking and how they were reacting to uh, the way that I was behaving. And so we worked out uh, a large number of um, keywords or, or phrases so that when we were in public and I began to descend uh, or, or behave in a way that, that wasn't socially acceptable, uh, Tracy would use one of these phrases or she would use one of these key words. And when she did, I would immediately realize that uh, I'm doing something wrong. And, and I wouldn't know what it was that I was doing wrong. I, I wouldn't know why I was doing something wrong, but I absolutely knew that Tracy would not say those things. Uh, she wouldn't use those prompts uh, unless I was headed in a very bad direction. And my desire not to go back to an insane asylum meant that whenever she said, hey, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're behaving in a, in a strange way here, uh, I would immediately stop. Like, again, at that point, I would abdicate everything over to my wife and I would follow her advice. I, I, you know, I would let her uh, effectively lead me in these um, in these community uh, uh, situations or, or, or in engaging, even with my children. Right. I mean, you know, I don't know if any of y'all have ever been around kids, uh, certainly ever raised kids. But, you know, there are times when they can be kind of aggravating. I know, I know, they're, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, everybody loves kids, uh, but, you know, sometimes they can get on your nerves, uh, and not being prepared to deal with that well on, on these occasions, right, I mean, so, again, there was a, there was a cycle of ups and downs, um, 
mostly downs, but you know, sometimes I'd get up to like almost average uh, before I'd descend again. And Tracy, Tracy would, uh, Tracy would say, Hey, and when she did, I had to exercise extreme self-discipline. Uh, I mean, it, an extreme amount of self-control in order to not follow what my my own emotions and feelings and, and internal turmoil was welling up in me saying, you know, to, to push this out and, and here's how we're going to to deal with uh, all of all of this bundle of whatever this nastiness is in me. Uh, and I I very much uh, visualized within me this this roiling sea of wrath, like like I wanted to tear, I wanted to destroy, I wanted to rip, I wanted to get my hands on something and make it not be whatever it was before I got a hold of it, and and there was just this thing constantly in me that's just roiling and 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 demanding to be released through uh, some sort of violence, some sort of uh, uh, outside, just, just not, not healthy and, and, and not good. Uh, and I had some outlets, you know, we bought a, um, we bought a punching bag and, and hung it, uh, here so that, uh, you know, during some of these situations, Tracy, she'd tell me, Hey, why don't you go punch on the, uh, the heavy bag for a while? And I would just stop whatever I was doing. And I'd, I'd go down to the basement and put on some gloves and just go to punching that thing until, I punched all of it out, you know, or uh, chop wood, you know, uh, you know, I'd get my ax, I'd go out back and I would just swing that thing all day long until I couldn't swing it anymore. Uh, I made sure that I never ran out of wood. <laughs> There's always plenty of wood in the backyard, uh, for me to, to work on. Uh, right. So, but you know, the, what I want you to get is that, uh, Tracy and I were trying to work out um, ways to deal with my, uh, my internal issues, my, my, my mental issues, my emotional issues. And for the most part, uh, we did a fairly good job with regards to hiding it from everybody else. Right. Uh, you know, again, there, there were, I don't think that there was anybody between 20, uh, 20, uh, yeah, 2000 and 2015. I, I don't think that there was anybody that could comprehend apart from Tracy, uh, you know, the depth and breadth of, uh, the, the, the pain and, and suffering and, and despair, uh, that, that I would experience. But, um, at the same time, there, there were only a handful of people that had any sense that maybe something was going on. Um, and in retrospect, you know, I, I look back at this and, and, and that was a, that was a very bad way of, um, dealing with the situation. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it is guaranteed that I caused myself more trauma by attempting to deal with it in that method than I would have in any number of ways that I could have attempted to deal with it. And again, at this point, I hadn't even gotten to scripture and I haven't even gotten to, uh, you know, how, how God, uh, worked in me to my knowledge, right? Like, like I was aware that God was working in me because he was clearly working in me through all of this. Uh, but there's always, you know, like, like we, uh, we're, we're talking about last week, there's always that sense of, you know, um, what God is doing and has done versus what I've experienced of what God is doing and has done. Uh, you know, and he's often is doing or has done long before I'm aware of his doing and, and done. Uh, so, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking primarily in the sense of, you know, just in my, in mine and, and, and Tracy's own sense of, of just human being and capability, uh, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't a good way of, of dealing with things because what, 
it resulted in was pulling the rug over. Yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, if y'all have an idiom, uh, idiom like that in in India, but uh, you know, one of the things here in America is, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, sweeping the dust under the rug, right? You know, somebody's coming over to visit real quick, and you want to sweep the 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 living room floor real quick or, or whatever, and so you just lift the rug and you sweep everything under the rug real quick, and you throw the rug over it, and so when the visitors come, they don't see that uh that dirt or that that trash that what they see and what they experience is a nice clean room it's not nice and clean because you got a pile of muck and and, and dirt and whatever was on the floor under the rug right um and so that's that's what we had effectively done with with some of my issues right we had just swept it under the rug and to uh the outside world Everything was hunky dory. Everything was fine. Uh, we we managed to hide uh, what what was going on, but not deal with it. Right there, there was no um, there was no sense of I had overcome any of these problems. Uh, that there was no sense that I was even fighting these challenges. Uh, what was happening was when I would descend into a a. a episode, I think would be the best way to call it. Uh, so when I descend into an episode, Tracy would tell me, Hey, things are going down. Uh, we, we need to, we need to do that, uh, thing that we do when things aren't going so well. And I would abdicate responsibility to her. And then I would begin to exercise just this ironclad self-control to not let myself do anything that Tracy didn't agree was okay for me to do and to listen to my wife and and do what she was guiding me to do again all so that I wouldn't go back to an asylum all all of that was so that I, I wouldn't go back to that place and, and experience that uh again and when I would come out of of these um episodes she would tell me hey I think you're um I think you're doing well again you can you know you can lead again. You can, uh, you know, you can do normal things again. Uh, you, you don't have to, um, you don't have to exercise that, that self-discipline and that lockdown. And then we'd do that until, till I had another episode. And of course, uh, around 2001, uh, 2002. So about two years after I was out of the military, uh, I really began pursuing Christ and, uh, there were, there were amazing things going on in my life, uh, utterly fantastic. Uh, you know, I mean, just wonder, uh, miracles that that Tracy and I could look back to and and talk about and and share, and and, and the experience of them was was just mind blowing. Uh, but there was no deliverance from the um, from the the depression. Uh, from the despair, from from the the mental anguish uh, that that I would experience, and I uh, shared with you last week that I I started looking through Scripture trying to find an answer, right? Like like how how do I deal with this in Christ? Um, you know, uh, for for a time I bought into the lie that said. Well, God made me this way, so this must be the way that I'm supposed to be. Um, God didn't make me broken, and that's not the way I'm supposed to be. And if you ever fall into believing that lie yourself, you need to recognize that that it's a lie, uh, and and it's a lie that one will use as an excuse to not confront the problem. It's it's a it's a way to be lazy. And it's a way to to put off uh, dealing with issues that need to be deal, dealt with. Uh, and again, I, I there was a point where I was really just bought into that, uh, just just bought into this. God made me full of anger. He made me full of rage. I don't know why he made me this way. I don't want to be this way. You know, but my problem was I kept reading scripture, and scripture kept saying, "Hey, dude, don't be angry." Uh, dude, don't, don't, don't be full of wrath. Don't, uh, uh, especially in the ways that I was being right. I, uh, and, and if you're wondering, you can absolutely be angry and not sin, right? That's, that's a thing you can do. Uh, humans, we're, we're just not really good at it. And me in particular, I'm, I'm, a, I was absolutely horrible at that. Uh, but, but 
I, I would read scripture and, and, and constantly, uh, you know, the, there was this sense of peace that I read about that I was supposed to have as a believer. Uh, there was, there was this sense of calm that I understood was, uh, what, what experience, what experience, uh, Christians should normally expect, right? I mean, like there were these things that I didn't believe that I was experiencing that I felt like I should be experiencing and utterly confused as to why, right? Like, like, why am I not experiencing this, this normal Christian ideal that I see in the New Testament, right? I'm not even talking about, you know, what I would see in other men and women, just, just reading through the New Testament and, and, and how believers are described and, and what they're commanded to do and, and the assumptions that the apostles made about them as they gave them other instructions uh, that wouldn't make sense without, without some of those core uh, assumptions in place. It, it just, uh, it, it just really hurt me that I, I couldn't get it until I got it, right? So uh, it, it was a little more than five years ago that I began to get it. Um, and, and we talked about that last week, which is being calm, at peace, and content in the situation that I'm in, right? You know, once, once I realized that the removal of the issue wasn't what I needed, that, that getting rid of suffering wasn't the answer, getting rid of pain in, in, in this life uh, isn't the answer desirable. Absolutely. I said that last week, and I don't want anybody that didn't hear last week to hear this week and go, this guy, you know, like desirable, go to God, pray for that, ask for that, desirable to get rid of these things in our lives, but it's not what I need right? What I need is to be content in Christ in whatever situation I'm in, right? And, and, and again, we, we talked a lot about that last week. And knowing that, uh, knowing that was the first step for me in overcoming my my challenges um, in in dealing with these episodes, but knowing that that's what I was supposed to do, and knowing how to do that, two very different things, right? Uh, I, you know, I've got a, a an extremely good friend, very close friend of mine, and one of the things that that he often responds uh, to to any question is uh, just just love other people. And people ask him questions. He's like, well, just, just love other people, you know? And uh, his answer is absolutely correct, right? Like, like that's the answer. Anytime you're dealing with someone else, love them. That's the answer. Uh, but then, you know, that's, that's such a broad answer. How do you love them, right? I mean, how do you love your enemy? Uh, how do you love a stranger? Uh, how do you love a neighbor that isn't particularly lovable? I mean, you know, like, like, how do you do that? What does it look like? Uh, how, how do, how, you know, how does one, how does one become content in suffering? That, that was, that was the next question uh, that, that I had to deal with. And I struggled, uh, struggled for quite a while trying, trying to figure out how do I, how do I pursue that? What, what does that look like? Where, where do I go to, to get this peace of mind in the middle of this turmoil, this utter battlefield of my mind that is exploding? It's full of minds. It's, it's dragging me down. I'm, 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 I'm so despairing of even life and breathing. Where's, where's the calm? Where's the, the peace and the contentedness in Christ in the situation? And again, I, you know, I, I, understood at a at a foundational at a at an internal level that the answer was in scripture that the, the answer had to be in scripture 
and that I had to go to scripture and I had to find it there, that that's where God was going to show it to me. That's where he was going to tell me how to deal with these things. And um, I, I discovered something. I'm, I'm going to tell you a axiom right now. It's a, it's a truth and it's, uh, it's immutable. Uh, you, you know, this is, you can, you can trust what I'm about to say. The answer to every problem is the same. Every sin, every challenge where, where we are, are beat down, it's the exact same. Repent confess and get back to work right Re repent confess and get back to work that's how, that's how you deal with every sin you you commit adultery you want to move on you you repent you confess and and, and you get back up and you don't do that again right like like that's sort of what the christian does is when we sin we get back up we stop it Right? Like, like the definition of a Christian is don't do that anymore. Stop the sin. Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's lying, if it's embezzling at work, if it's looking at porn, if whatever it is, the answer is always the same. Repent, confess, and get back to work. That's, that's what Christians do. And no matter what the challenge is, right? Like, like, you know, not having an arm, right? If like, if you, if you completely lose one of your arms, that's, that's a significant handicap and it might not be your fault. Maybe you didn't do anything crazy. Maybe you didn't do anything stupid. You weren't foolish, but it happened to you anyway. You've not sinned in that. You've, you've just taken into yourself the result of a broken world that we live in. Perhaps someone else's sin, but absolutely part of a broken world. Uh, per perhaps you're a uh, cripple. You, you can't walk and you ha have to live in a wheelchair, right? Um, you know, perhaps you're blind and you can't see. Uh, perhaps you're, you're deaf. I, I was talking earlier about needing my hearing aids in because I couldn't understand what somebody was saying. You know, I mean, we, we have things that happen to us, uh, and, and the answer to those is the same as well. We, we need Jesus to overcome these challenges. It's, it's, it's not different. Um, you know, being a, you, you want to be a better parent, you need Jesus. You want to, uh, you want to overcome uh, a handicap, you need Jesus. You want to be a, a better uh, individual at work, you, you need Jesus. You want to, right, like, I mean, I can keep going on, like the axiom is true for the believer, right? The, the non-believer, it's still a truth, but it's not a truth for them because they need Jesus, right? Like the answer is still the same for the unbeliever and the believer. You need the same thing. Repent, confess, pursue Christ. Uh, go to Jesus with your problems and be content in Jesus regardless of what the problem is. Um, so, again, knowing that that's true, whether whether you're struggling with the exact same problems that I struggle with, uh, whether you're struggling with other uh, depression issues or anxiety issues, uh, emotional or mental issues, you know, some, sometimes, right, like you could just be tired. That That's that's a thing that happens, right? Like, like people get tired and they get depressed, not clinically depressed, not what I'm talking about depressed, but that doesn't change the fact that they're depressed and they're worn out. And pain is relative, right? My worst pain in the world is not your worst pain in the world, right? Somebody that has never experienced a paper cut, they've never experienced any pain whatsoever, and they get one little bitty paper cut, they're going to behave just like somebody that had their leg broken because it's the worst pain that they've ever experienced. And, and the same thing is, is true with despair and, and, and depression and 
You know, you can't compare your depression with someone else's. You can't compare your anxiety with someone else's. Uh, you know, it, it, it's like the uh, the arrogant kid at school. I don't, I don't know if y'all have this, but, you know, whenever I was growing up, we'd always have these uh, cold days at school, and some kid would show up without a jacket, and he'd look at everybody else and be like, it's not cold. I was cold, right? Like you, the fact that you're not cold doesn't make me not cold. Uh, you know, the you can't you can't compare these feelings in in a way that is a, a one for one that you can measure unit by unit. Um, so don't fall into that trap of saying my my depression is is so much more than your depression. You can't understand, right? Because it, it's not true. Depression is depression. Um, how we react to it is how we react to it. And, and it's absolutely true that uh, it gets worse, right? Like uh, I shared with you last week, I, I live in a, a state of constant pain. And um, the pain that I'm experiencing right now, sitting here having this this conversation with you, just just the pain that I'm living with at the moment would have hospitalized me 20 years ago. I would have I would have been screaming for pain meds. I would I would be begging someone to put me out of my misery. I would be weeping and gnashing my teeth. But it turns out that you can get used to pain, right? And it, it turns out that that you can get used to despair, you can get used to anxiety, and as as you are, used to is not the right word, acclimated is probably a better word. You can become acclimated to these things, um, and as you become acclimated to these things, uh, you begin to differentiate between lesser and, and worser, right? Like, like, am I getting worse or am I getting better? Uh, and and the more experience you have, uh, the greater is your um, uh, uh, width or breadth of um, ability to measure your experience, your pain, your depression, your anxiety, your despair. Uh, but everybody doesn't have the same units of measurements, right? And, and again, uh, somebody might be experiencing what you would consider level two pain on a scale of, say, one to ten. They're at two. And for you, you'd be like, if I was at two, man, I'd feel, that'd be great. I'd love to be at two, right? But for them, that's a ten, right? For, for them, it's, it's the worst. Um, so, so don't make this, don't make this, uh, this is a freebie. I, I wasn't planning to tell you this, but, but don't make this mistake of trying to compare, um, your challenges with someone else's challenges to that degree of specificity, right? Don't, don't tell someone you're not in pain. That doesn't hurt. It, it, it does. And, and they are, uh, just because it, wouldn't be that much pain to you it, just because it wouldn't hurt you that much doesn't change the way that that it wounds them um, and hearing you dismiss their pain uh, you just consider how you feel when someone else dismisses yours right like uh, you know if you're you're really struggling with depression you're really struggling with anxiety you're you're really struggling uh, with you know whatever issue you're really struggling with being a good parent I don't know. And somebody comes along and says, oh, no, you're not struggling. Oh, no, you're not depressed. Oh, no, you're not having anxiety. And you're like, the heck you say? I mean, yeah, I'm, I am. And, but but people are, are, no, no, it's not that bad. Like, like, dude, you don't know how bad it is. You need to get inside my head. I'm pretty sure you'd go crazy if you were in here. You wouldn't be saying I don't, I, you know, but don't dismiss other people. Right, because you've got the experience, especially if you're dealing with chronic issues of of pain, chronic issues of depression, chronic issues of anxiety, despair. You're dealing with these things ongoing. You should know that you don't dismiss someone else, and that you there's a there's a sense of compassion that you should feel for them, knowing what they're going through because you've been through it. So, getting getting back to to my point. Um, before I, I got off on that rabbit trail there. Sorry about that. Um, going to scripture to discover 
uh, what and how to be content in Christ in the midst of suffering. Uh, and, I, and I'm just going to say suffering, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be any particular type of suffering. Uh, and again, we're not particularly talking about suffering that's brought on because of sin, right? I mean, like, if you touch a hot eye and you burn your hand, well, you kind of deserve to be burnt, right? Like, you should have known better than that. You, you don't, that, that was foolishness and you got just desserts. Um, you know, if, 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 if you decide to enter into sin and you get paid what you invested in, which is going to be pain and heartache when you invest in sin, uh, that's not the suffering that we're talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the chronic, the ongoing, the suffering that is not directly due to your own sin. Uh, the, the kind of suffering that, that God brings on us and allows to work in us to modify, to change, and to build up our character and, and to help us transform from the person that we were into the person that we are and towards the person that we will be. And all of those are extremely different people. And God uses these processes of trials and of tribulations uh, to, to work through and mold and, and create us. And so, you know, again, like I said last week, after I, after I realized that, um, that it was contentedness that I needed to be seeking as opposed to delivery from the suffering, um, I started looking for, okay, God, so how do I, how do I deal with this? And, uh, I, I need you to, to show that to me. And what I learned, uh, is that God's got quite a lot to say on how to, um, how to deal with these issues. But ultimately, and again, the answer becomes the same for all issues, Ultimately, it comes down to faith, right? Ultimately, it's going to come down to what do you believe? And, and, and not what do you believe with your words, right? Like, like people, people can claim a belief, right? They, they, can, they can speak a, uh, a knowledge or an acceptance of a, a fact or a truth. They can do these things without actually believing them. You know, it's, it's not until these things are, 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 are made into an action that you can verify the, the faith, that you verify the belief, right? And until then, it's, it's, it's just in our head. And uh, again, I shared with you last week, there's some things I believe, right? Uh, there, there's some core truths that are so foundational and so unmovable in my life <coughs> that um, that they shape everything else that goes on. Uh, and, and, and those core truths are, are wrapped up in the one truth that God is sovereign. Uh, but breaking that down, uh, you know, my God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He can do whatever he chooses to do. And there is nothing that can stop him from doing whatever he has determined will be done. I believe that about my God and I have faith in my God that that is truth. I believe that my God is omniscient, that he knows Everything, and by everything, I mean everything that ever was, everything that is, and everything that ever will be. He's got it all on lockdown. There's, there's nothing, there's no piece of information anywhere that has ever or will ever escape his comprehension and the knowing of it. I believe that he's omnipresent that he is in all places at all times, simultaneously. Simultaneously, he's everywhere, all the time, and there's no place that he's not. And the, the most critical thing is that I believe he loves me. And if those four things are true, 
if I am loved by a being that is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipowerful, then that being must, because he loves me, have my best interest at heart. Right? Like, that, like that's what love is. And if, if that being has my best interest at heart, and that being, because he knows everything, comprehends and understands the depth of despair that, that my broken mind takes me to, and has chosen not to deliver me from that, then it must be the absolute best place for me to be right now. And, and that's a hard pill to swallow. And, and I've had, I've, I've said that to people and they've looked at me and their eyes have gotten big and they have been like, like you, do you really believe that? Um, the answer is yes, I really believe that. And that becomes the, the next pillar that holds me in the peace and the contentedness and the comfort in Christ while I'm experiencing that situation because I believe that. It doesn't matter how much pain my body is in. I believe that it's the best place for me to be because that's where God has placed me. It doesn't matter how horrible the depths of my mind go. I believe that those are the best places for me to be because that's where God has placed me. Now, a lot of people will say, Papa, I cannot comprehend how that can possibly be the best place. Well, I can absolutely tell you, and, and Scripture tells us that, that this is what will happen. Uh, we're not going to look at that today. We'll look at that later. But but Scripture tells us what the outworking of trials and tribulations and, and, and these various things that God allows us to experience is. And it's about our character. It's about building up endurance. It's about uh, building up self-discipline. It's about demonstrating to ourselves our own faith. Do you get that? I mean, other people should see my faith, but I'm proving to myself my own faith in experiencing these things and, and, and going through them. And absolutely, I have become, through these trials, through these tribulations, a different person. I, I endure. I endure. And I'm not going to stop. There's, there's not going to be a time, there's not going to be a place where I stop. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other, and I'm going to keep doing that in the pursuit of glorifying God, and nothing, nothing will stop me. My own mind breaking into pieces does not stop me because I believe God, and I believe his promises. And, and that's the fight. That's the battle. And that's where we begin to overcome is when we believe and when we have such faith in God that we can look at the most utterly, unimaginably horrible outcome for ourselves and walk straight into it with a smile on our face, knowing, and I'm going to glorify God in this. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to turn my head. I'm not going to bow my back. My shoulders won't stop. I'm going to put them against the plow, and I'm going to push, and I'm going to keep pushing, and I won't stop no matter what. And I know that that is a truth for me today because of what I've been through. I've proven to myself 
that I don't stop. And my wife, she still asks me almost on a daily basis. She says, are you doing okay? Are you going to be okay? And I, I smile at her and I say, yeah. Yeah, being okay is what I do. I'm not going to stop being okay because I'm in Christ. It still hurts. I still cry. I still pray, God, it'd be really nice if we could do this another way. Could you deliver me? Could, could, you, could you take away the pain? Could you take away the despair? Could you take it away? Is there another way for us to do that? I would really prefer to do it another way. But if this is the way, and I believe that you know best, then this is the way I'm going to do it. And that, that is how I have fought and, and won this fight and this war that is constantly waging inside my own psyche, uh, that, that is, is constantly uh, trying to, to get out and overcome. And again, if we go back to the conversation we had last week about the dual nature of believers, the dual nature of the Christian, right? That's where the war is, right? Like, like my old nature wants to deal with the situation the way I dealt with it in the past, right? By acting out, by effectively throwing a tantrum, right? By, by reverting to being a two-year-old. And, and I mean, can you imagine a 50 year old, my size throwing a tantrum? Cause that's what my body wants. That's what my flesh says should be done. Or I live in Christ, right? Either, either I'm, either I'm choosing in this moment to, to, to live in the flesh, or I'm choosing in this moment to live in Christ and I choose Christ. And, and, and I want you to choose Christ. And I absolutely believe that everything that I have been through, all of the pain, all of the suffering, all of the frustration, all of the aggravation, every tear, every drop of blood was so that I could tell you this, so that I can testify that God is greater than any despair. God is greater than any depression. He is greater than any anxiety. And you need to know that so that you can believe that. Mental health, it's not found by gorging on self-scrutiny. It's found by dining on the remedies of God that you find in Scripture. That, that's where we have to go. And we have to know them. And we have to believe them. So we're going to look at some scripture here real quick. I want to uh, look over at 2 Peter. I'm going to see. Can y'all see that? Shake your head. Oh, I see thumbs up. All right. Battlefield of the brain, minefield of the mind, because those are cool, right? Like the, the battlefield and the brain start with B and minefield and mind start with, if I have to explain it, it's not as cool. All right. So um, first thing we want to do is we want to look at Second Peter. I'm going to read this. It's going to be on the screen. I want, I want you to look at it. Uh, you know, the uh, emphasis is mine. Uh, you're not probably going to find that in your Bible, uh, but uh, I, I want to bring out a, a few key ideas here. Uh, and, and write this down, right? Second Peter uh, 1, uh, you know, it's going to be the first uh, few verses there that we're going to look at. And go back and look at those later as well, because I want you to think about this. Here we go. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him 
who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Missed that almost. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to conform your calling and election for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Now, if we, we look back through this real quick, um, you know, you'll see that the idea here that I'm, I'm pushing towards you is that there's something about knowledge that you want to get. Um, there's something about knowledge with self-control, knowing, being self-controlled and steadfast, right? In, in, in this particular mental battle that we're talking about, right? It's going to keep us from being ineffective and unfruitful, right? The people that don't have these qualities, that don't have the knowledge, that don't have the self-control, and don't have the steadfastness, they're blind, right? And, 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 and faith over here, whoops, went back. Here we go. Faith over here is a big deal, right? I mean, like, like all of this has to do with faith. Do you believe what you know? Do you believe it or you just know it? I mean, like James said, Satan knows things. He knows that Jesus is God, but he doesn't have a faith in Jesus as his Savior and Christ. So what do you what do you know? What do you believe? And do you exercise self-control? And are you steadfast in exercising that self-control? Because if you practice this. You won't fall. If you practice these qualities, it is in this way, in this way, which is the practicing of these qualities, you get an entrance into the eternal kingdom. You also confirm your own calling election for yourself, right? Uh, we don't have time to go look at it, but but um, if, if you'll go look at 1 John, uh, one of the things that he teaches us there is that in order for us to know our own salvation, a lot of people ask me, they're like, how do, how do I know that I'm saved? And I say, go read 1 John. But you know, one of the things that we learn in 1 John is that John tells us, look at your works. Do you want to know if you're saved? Look at what you're doing. Is what you're doing reflecting what you know, believe, and practice about God or not? That's how you're going to know. That's how you're going to confirm to yourself your own calling, your own election. And again, he's going to remind, right? He's, he's, this is knowledge he's talking about. I'm going to remind you of these things that you know. 
because I'm thinking about them and I want to remind you about them. I want you to be able to recall them. All the way back to the first couple of verses, right? This is an amazing sentence. And I don't know if y'all spend much time thinking about English grammar, but Paul's Greek does crazy. Like, what a run-on sentence. I would have failed high school if I wrote sentences like this. But Paul gets away with it because Scripture, God. Okay, uh, <laughs> his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. I want to pick this apart and, 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 hopefully make it a little bit clearer what he's saying, right? Because these transition words like through, this means something. By means something. So means something. Having means something. And, and it's a it's about rhetoric and it's about logic and it's about building an argument. And let's see what he says, right? Divine nature, this is this is the point, right? This is what we want. This is what we're after. Again, dual natures, you can play around in the flesh nature, or you can be in the divine nature. You get to choose. You're a believer. You're, you've got two natures to, to, to work with now. The divine nature, that's the one that we as believers are seeking to be in in every moment. So this divine nature that we're after, how do we get that, right? Where, where, does, this, where does this divine nature come through? It comes through precious and great promises, precious and great promises. Do you know what those precious and great promises are? Whatever they are, they're granted to us. How are they granted to us? There we go. They're granted to us through knowledge of him. It is the knowing of God. The knowing of God. That's that's where we that's where faith comes from. Uh, you know, uh, Paul talks about it in Romans. He says, you know, how will they know if if no one goes and tells them? Right? You can't believe in what you're ignorant of. You can't know what you don't know. You have to have knowledge. John Piper, uh, he, he, he says something about this verse along the lines of, how great is doctrine then? Should not the Christian love and pursue ever more knowledge of him? Because it's granted to us, these, these precious and great promises are granted to us through knowledge of him. And through these great and precious promises, we're going to see this divine nature. That's amazing. Now, one of the ways that this works in dealing with whatever situation you're in, again, be it depression, uh, be it a physical handicap, uh, be it uh, 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 just uh, an activity that you don't like, perhaps uh, getting locked up in prison or parenting, Sometimes they can be similar during the COVID. Um, whatever your situation is, God has promises for those situations. Do you know what those promises are? Because if you don't know what the promises are, you can't believe those promises. Do, do, do you Get the logic there? Do you under do you comprehend what we're saying? Like, like you can't believe in what you don't know. How are you going to find comfort in the promises of God in your situation if you don't know the promises? And so now, whenever I descend into depression, right, when I descend into uh, these these nasty places or or when the pain just gets unbearable, whatever the situation is, 
I go straight to scripture and start looking for those promises. I write those promises down. I keep spreadsheets of promises. And in any situation, I repeat to myself, I memorize, I meditate on, and I remember the promises that God has made to me. Not any God, my sovereign God, all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient, um, uh, present, omnipresent, loving God has made these promises to me. They're mine. And whatever happens out here in this fallen world to this fallen flesh, the promises are mine and they're not going to get taken away. And I can weep and I can wail while I'm full of joy because I have precious and great promises. And I have a divine nature that I can rest in. And if you don't know that you have that, you can't do it. Right? And, and this is why Paul later in these verses is saying, let me remind you, don't forget I want you to recall, and so much more I want you to recall when you're in the midst of the anxiety, when you're in the midst of the depression, right? Like, like these things are direct attacks on the thinking, right? Like, like it's the thinky, thinky parts that are getting assaulted. And it's the thinky, thinky parts that we need to recall these things. And so that's where the self-control and steadfastness come in. We have to exercise that. We have to exercise that in those situations where we go back and we say, I got promises. Satan, you can do whatever you want to do with this, but I got the promises. The promises are mine. Yeah, that hurt. What you did right there stings. I don't like it, but I got the promises. This is just a short little, little thing. I've got eternity, bro. I've got promises for eternity and a little bit of suffering right now. And I'm going to take it. And I'm going to glorify God in the midst of it because you know what? Somebody else might see. Somebody else might see and they might come up to me and they might say, Bubba, you are strange. I see that you are suffering and yet you smile. You've got joy. What in the world is going on with you? And I can say, Jesus, let me tell you what you need. Let me, let me tell you how you deal with it. Let me tell you how you suffer and be joyful at the same time. How you can be content in the situation because you are content in Christ. Because I've got precious and great promises. And they're mine. They were granted to me and I know it. And I got faith in it and it gets me through and it will get you through one of the precious and great promises like like that's a promise it'll deliver you it'll get you through it'll make it happen it's real i'm testifying it's happened for me it can happen for you it definitely happened for paul you know that boy got whooped Every time he went into a new city, they beat him, they starved him, they threw him in prison, they hollered at him, they mocked him. Sometimes they would stone him. And your boy was like, but I got God. This is how he had God. This, this is how it worked. This is your mind under sin. This is what scripture tells you a mind under sin looks like. It's confused. It's anxious, it's closed, it's evil, it's restless, rash and deluded. It's troubled, it's depraved, sinful, dull, blinded, corrupt. Well, that's my depression right there, right? That, that's my anxiety right there. That's it. God, God just said, hey, dude, your broken mind under sin. This is, let me, let me, let me tell you what it looks like. Right? These are, and there's many other descriptions of what our minds under sin look like. But I think these capture enough for today that, that 
you can go and you you can look at this and you can go, okay, so scripture knows what a broken mind looks like. Right? Scripture scripture knows what that is. Um, you know, people um around me are often sold a gospel that is no gospel at all. Um, but but they're basically told if you become a believer, everything's going to be great. You'll be rich. You'll be healthy. Uh, you know, all, all the things are going to be fantastic. You know, and I, and I tell them, I'm, I'm sorry somebody lied to you because when you become a Christian, the only thing that changes is you. You still have to deal with the aftermath and the consequences of the sin that you've lived in up to this point. If you have a bad relationship with your in-laws, you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and have a bad relationship with your in-laws. If you haven't paid your bills, you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and still owe. If uh, if you haven't been a good employee, you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and still have a reputation as a poor employee. If you've been a bad neighbor, you're going to wake up tomorrow and still people are still going to believe you're a bad neighbor, right? Like Like... The problems don't disappear. What happens is you've changed and you're beginning to change and you're beginning to become someone that seeks to solve relationship issues instead of exacerbate them and, and ignore them. You, you, you seek to become someone that pays your bills. You, you, you seek to become someone that doesn't get into debt, that, that is... is uh, not something that you can handle. You, you tend to be someone that pursues being a good neighbor. You tend to be someone that pursues being a good laborer and, and someone who is known as a diligent worker. That's what's changed, but it takes time for the rest of the world to start noticing that change. Oh, they'll notice immediately, but they're not going to buy into it until you've been steadfast and consistent in it. And then, then they're going to go, hey, this this person. So you don't you don't just wake up with your mind healed, right? You you don't you don't come to Christ and go, Lord, you know, I want, I want to live for you. I love you. And I mean, some people do get to enjoy miracles like that, but the normal experience is that you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're still going to be dealing with the consequences of whatever was afflicting you before. You became a believer. What's changed is how you respond to the situation. And ignorance guarantees ungodliness. I want you to just think about that for a minute. Now, this is from a devotional by John Piper. Uh, I think you can probably Google ignorance guarantees ungodliness with John Piper's name, and you'll probably find the devotional. Um, you know, so so I'm I'm standing on John Piper's shoulders. These these are his words, and I appreciate them. All of the power available from God to live and be godly comes through knowledge. What a premium we should put on doctrine and inscript, instruction and in scriptures, life and godliness are at stake. My mental health is at stake. Not knowing, uh, I'm sorry, not that knowing guarantees godliness. You, you see what he's saying? Like, like, if you don't know, you're guaranteed to be ungodly, but just because you know doesn't guarantee that you will be godly. The divine power that leads through godliness is given through the knowledge of God. Uh, Piper's got a lot of good stuff uh, to, to say on this. Uh, also, Rick Warren, uh, surprisingly enough. <laughs> Rick Warren's uh, uh, got some stuff to say. Uh, again, if you Google Rick Warren and Destroying Strongholds, and um, you'll uh, you'll find some good stuff by, by uh, Mr. Warren. I've seen the face of mental illness. I've seen what it is like when people are unable to hear God because their minds are broken and cannot seem to connect to God even when they want to connect to God. 
And I know whatever gets in your mind gets you. So one of the most important things we need to learn and teach others is how to guard, strengthen, and renew our minds because the battle for sin always starts in the mind. Always. Guys, there are times when, and, and again, I visualize this, and, and there's a piece of my mind that, that I visualize as right here, and it disappears. It's just not there anymore. And, and it's a piece of mind that has to do with uh, passion and with emotion and, and with relationship. And I just don't feel, I don't feel any passion for anything. I'm not hot and I'm not cold. I am lukewarm when that piece of my mind disappears. I don't comprehend compassion because I don't even comprehend the emotion that other people are trying to show me. I can't see it. I can't taste it. I mean, unless it is completely overt, but even if you're crying, I might have to ask you, are you happy or sad if the context can't help me understand that? Because I can't feel anything. And my mind gets broken like that. And when my mind is broken like that, I turn to the promises of God. And I say, I know that I have felt before, and I know that I will feel again. And despite the fact that I can't feel right this moment, I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure it out. In this moment, in this time, I'm going to do it. Because 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh... Let me make this personal. Though I walk in the flesh, I'm not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons of my warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. I destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and I take every thought captive to obey Christ. And I'm ready to punish every disobedience when my obedience is complete. And I want that to be true for you. But look at this. These strongholds, the second sentence here. We have divine power to destroy strongholds. You should ask yourself, what are the strongholds? Because he immediately explains it to us in the next sentence. It's arguments. It's lofty opinions. It's anything raised against the knowledge of God, the knowing of God. These are the strongholds. These are the lies that we tell ourselves. These are the ways that we are deluded and the ways that we delude ourselves and the ways we delude others to not know God. And we're to destroy these things. We're to take every single thought in our head captive. And, and, and the ones that ain't right get punished. I destroy them. And I seek for my obedience to be complete. And this is how I overcome my personal challenges. And this is how you should overcome your personal challenges. You don't know what you don't know. So no. Get some learning, memorize, soak in, find out, figure out, talk to others, get some learning, and know, know what God has said, know what he has promised, and recognize, discern, judge what he hasn't said, what he hasn't promised, where the lies are, because we know from the beginning Satan is a liar. And his lies are subtle. Did, did God really say? Yes! Yeah, God really said. Now get out of my face. God said. I know.
God said. I know, God said. And I will destroy you any thought that is not what God said. Any thought that attacks my God, any thought that attacks the truth of God, it must be destroyed. And I can feel pain. Pain does not attack the knowledge of God. Believing that God doesn't love me because I'm in pain is wrong and is a lie. Believing that I can't glorify God because I can't feel this piece of my mind that is missing is a lie and it's got to go. If I believe it, I will sin against my God. So I have to take these thoughts captive because they're popping up in me. The flesh in me is telling me the lies. God don't really care about you. If God cared about you, know, if he loved you, he wouldn't make, he'd take away the pain. I mean, you might as well just go out and act a fool because you'll feel better. There is a fifth of Jim Beam somewhere and it has your name on it. And it is in a bar full of the biggest bikers you have ever seen, just waiting for you to grab up your bottle of whiskey, start drinking, and start punching. And, and that's probably not normal what goes through your head. But the flesh in me says that. The flesh in me says, hey, you know what? Let's go find the biggest, meanest, toughest crowd of dudes that we can, get drunk, and start punching until I either pass out from being drunk or somebody knocks me out. That's, that's what my flesh wants. Your flesh probably wants something different and a lot less violent. That's, that's probably true. But it's a lie. That's not going to deliver me. That's not going to solve my problems. That's not going to help me. And I kill it. I take it captive. I punish it. I take it out behind the woodshed and I choke it out. It's not going to be in me or part of me. I'm not going to buy into it and I'm not going to believe it. And you have lies just like mine in yourself. Your flesh is telling you things that are raised up against the knowledge of God. You have strongholds within yourself that you need to get about the business of taking them down. And the great thing is you don't have to do it by yourself. God's given us a community of believers. And he's given us knowledge. These are some not knows from 1 Corinthians, right? I mean, like we're talking about what you know and what, what you don't know, right? And, and when Paul's writing this, he's asking, he's asking the reader, do you not know? Dude, do, do you not know? Did you, did you know you're going to judge angels? Did you know that? Have you thought about that? Did you know that just a little bit of sin creates a lot of sin? There's no such thing as a little white lie. Telling your wife that those genes do not make her rump look big is a little bit of leaven. Your wife knows that you will lie to her now. It's not a question of whether or not you will lie to her. The question is, how much do you lie to her? Think about that. The unrighteous are not going to go to heaven. Do you know that? Do you know that your bodies are members of Christ? You probably think about the fact that you're a member of a church, but do you know that your very body is a member of Christ? Sex, do you know that when you're joined to a prostitute, you become one body with her? Do you know that that also joins Christ with a prostitute because your body is a member of Christ? Do you know these things? Do you know that if you're a member of Christ and you're sitting there looking at porn, it's like you're sitting there with Jesus? Hey, dude, hey, what do you think about that? That's what you're doing. Sorry, get a little bit upset about that. You can't sin and not be bringing Christ into your sin if you're in Christ. You don't get to step out of Christ for a minute. 
You don't get to be a not a believer for a minute. I get people that tell me, they're like, well, you know, um, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, past, present, and future, and, and he knows I'm going to sin. So, you know, I mean, he he's okay with it whenever I stumble a little bit. No, he's not. He's hanging on a cross for your sins. You said you love Jesus? You said that. How do you love Jesus? How do you love anybody and say, you know what, it's okay that they're suffering for me? It's okay that I sin because he'll suffer for me. He's good like that. I love him. Right? Do you know or do you not know? There's a lot of ways that we can think about this. Uh, this is a, a simple workflow to think through this. Uh, it is not a complete, right? So it certainly breaks down at, at places, uh, but it communicates something that I, that I want you to get that we see in Scripture, right? Knowledge fuels our passion, and our passion is the energy for what we actually do. And what we actually do reveals our character. And it either reinforces or undermines what we know. So, so there's even a, a bit of a loop here where works feeds back into knowledge. Again, breaks down. Uh, they all feed together in a web in some ways. But this is a primary flow that I see in Scripture, and I hope that you've seen in, in, in the two passages that we looked at, I hope that what you see is that we get this knowledge. What we know fuels our passion. Not only can you not know what you don't know, you can't love what you don't know. You can't hate what you don't know. You cannot have any passion or even an opinion on what you don't know. But when you know something, then you have that passion for that thing. Then you go out and you actually do something in response to the passion that you have. I know people that are, uh, they, 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 they learned about math. They got passionate about math and they do Sudoku puzzles all the time. That, you know, that, that's a thing that happens. I know people uh, that learned about pornography and they got passionate about pornography. And so they go out and they look at pornography all the time. I mean, do you see how this works? It, it, It's not just uh, no knowledge of God, get a passion for God, and you'll actually do things for God. It's, it's more generalized than that. What you know is going to feed into your passions. Either you're going to hate it or you're going to love it. And then that passion is going to result in what you actually do. Either you're going to live righteous or you're going to live unrighteous. And then living in that way is going to either reinforce or undermine the knowledge that you had that fueled the passion that you had that caused you to do the things that you did. But you can't do things that you don't know to do and you can't have a passion for things that you don't know. It begins with knowledge. A knowledge of God is what we're talking about in Christ. So, hope what you're taking away from this is that as of last week, the goal, the goal here is to sort out how do I be content? Where do I find joy while I'm suffering? And once you see that in scripture, once you see that and you realize that that's the point, that's, that's what you need to be pursuing, and you decide to start pursuing that, the next thing is you need to get some knowledge. You need to know some things. What do you know about God, and what do you believe about God, and how much do you believe that? Do you believe what you know about God to the degree that you can look at your own brokenness, that you can feel the pain and weep, and simultaneously experience the great joy and contentedness of being in Christ? And if the answer is no, you need to get some more knowledge, you need to exercise some more faith. That, that's the answer. You need to be more passionate about the things of God. One last uh, thing I want to leave you with, and then we'll, we'll move on to the, the question time. Um, 
I've talked to a lot of guys about addiction. I've, I've, I've dealt with some addiction in my life and uh, addiction comes up pretty often. And addiction is another one of these uh, issues of battles in the mind. And an axiom, again, you, you can take this as a fact. It's an immutable truth. You do not overcome an addiction until you find something to replace that addiction with. What that means is you have to find something that you love more than you love the addiction before you will give up the addiction. This comes up a lot with pornography, right? Uh, that that tends to, to be one a lot of uh, young Christian men and, and some Christian women that I talk to uh, struggle with. And, and, you know, what they come to me with is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with uh, this pornography problem. Now, let me tell you how this fits in right? You're a believer and you sin. What does that do? It causes conviction, right? The Holy Spirit in you is saying, dude, that, that was wrong, right? Don't, that was bad. Uh, that wasn't a good thing, right? Uh, the conviction brings guilt, right? So you begin to feel the guilt. This is where those strongholds and those lies come in. They start saying, dude, you sinned. You're not really a believer. Dude, you, you keep sinning. You're not really a believer. You don't love Jesus. Uh, if you did, I mean, if you were really a believer, you know, you, you wouldn't be sinning. What you're supposed to do is repent and stop doing it. That's the truth. But a lot of times what we do is we get into this mindset. And so this guilt and this pressure builds on us and it feeds into our depression. It feeds into our anxiety. We become more depressed. We become more anxious because of the weight of the guilt of the sin that has been resting on us and the lies that we have believed about the sin that we have committed and whether or not we're in Christ. But we're addicted. That's that's what that's what we say. Whatever it is. I mean, maybe your addiction is Netflix. I don't know. Um, but we're addicted. And 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 these guys that come to me and they say, Bubba, you know, how, how do I how do I deal with my addiction? And I tell them, uh, you got to love something else more than you love the addiction. And they're like, No, you don't understand. Like I'm addicted. I can't I can't not do this thing that I'm addicted to. And I'm like, Well, what I'm trying to tell you is that you can not do the thing, but your problem is that you want to do the thing. Well, no, I don't want to. If I wanted to, I mean, if I didn't want to, I wouldn't do it. Right. I'm like, yeah, right. So that's what you just said, right? You do what you want to do and you don't do what you don't want to do. You want to do whatever you're addicted to. And it's a lie that you can't stop doing it because you're addicted to it. You won't stop doing it because you don't want to stop doing it. And they get upset. And so I ask them, I'm like, okay, I, I want to help you with your porn addiction. And, and you're saying that you can't go more than two days without looking at pornography. How long do you think is the longest you can possibly go without looking at pornography? I don't know, maybe, maybe three days. Okay. Three days. Three days as long as you can go without looking at pornography. Okay, how about we do this? And I'm being dead serious here. I have $10,000 in the bank. 10000 US dollars in the bank. If you can go without looking at pornography for 30 days straight, I'm going to give you $10,000. You think you can do that? Well, yeah, absolutely I can do that. Yeah, do you see what just happened? The love of money just overcome the love of looking at porn, right? I mean, just just before the guy was saying, I can't, I can't go more than two days. But for 10 grand, I can go 30, right? Like, like once we find the thing that we love more than the, the thing that we're doing, we overcome the thing that we're doing. Love Jesus more than anything and overcome addictions. Love Jesus more than anything. Love Jesus more than your comfort. Right? Love Jesus more than anything and you will break through all sorts of mental battles. You will 
tear down all sorts of strongholds. Love him, but you're not going to love him without knowing him. You're going to need to get to know him better. And there's not a point from here throughout eternity where you're going to know him completely. So there is always, every single day, room to know him better. Room to improve in your knowledge of knowing him so that you can grow in your love of him. And that, that will overcome everything in your life. Doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't mean that you won't feel the pain. It doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. It doesn't mean that you won't cry again while you're in this broken world. It means that you will overcome these things, that you will know how to live in the moment of suffering with the greatest possible peace and joy in your inner self.